Testing, testing, testing. I think it's working. Yeah. Testing. Okay. Testing. Testing. Testing, testing. Amen. Thank you, Shannon, for opening our service today with, with such a wonderful blessing of the gift of music. Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship here at St. Peter's on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're glad to see each of you here this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements I'd like to share. One is we do have our second Sunday fellowship breakfast immediately following our service this morning between church and Sunday school. So we hope you'll stay and uh, fellowship for a few minutes. And then if you're not already involved in a Sunday school class, we'll help you find one. I think Sunday school is really important. When I grew up, I always thought of Sunday school as something for little kids. But then I grew up and I became an adult Sunday school teacher of an adult Sunday school class. And I found there's such a wonderful time of learning and sharing and fellowship and community building in a class. So if that's something you're interested in, we will help you find a place. 
A couple of other announcements. This afternoon, um, we do have the Bible study that I'm leading on the Gospel of Mark. It will meet at 4.30 here. Uh, all of the children are reminded that Christmas, pray, Christmas play practice begins today at 5 and runs until 6. We've got Sisters in Christ on Tuesday morning. We've got uh, packing backpacks for Martha's Mission on, uh, I guess that's Tuesday afternoon. We've got the United Methodist Men are going to meet Tuesday evening. There are a lot of things going on in the life of the church, and we invite you to come and be a part of more than just a Sunday morning gathering because we're more than just Sunday morning people. An ongoing ministry we've had for years here has been our soup kitchen ministry where we provide a meal on the fourth I believe it's the fourth Saturday of the month at Hope Mission. Uh, we are looking for somebody who is willing to kind of coordinate all of that. Uh, we're not asking you to cook 60 pots of chili or anything like that. We're just saying we need someone who can help coordinate that, make it happen. Um, if, if you feel led to do that, if you would please contact either me or Donna Austin, and uh, we, can, we can help you get that going. So, uh, let's see. I've also got an announcement from Jackie Taylor this morning. Is that right? No, not Jackie. Who? Who? From Bill. Okay, from Bill. All right, this is, this is Bill Douglas. Thank you. Good morning, uh, fellow members of St. Peter's. Um, just to start off with, you probably noticed if you've been around long enough that I like to wear shorts and sneakers. But this is in honor of Jackie Taylor, who's led us on the finance committee for over a year. I dressed up. <laughs> the subject is tithing to our church. And I have a unique way of talking about that. I could say, well, there's 835 children that were fed this weekend on Thursday when 70 volunteers packed their bags. I could talk about that for a long time. I could talk about the 40 individuals who met in Greenville, North Carolina this week, all representing pantries throughout East, Eastern North Carolina from many counties. I can talk about the frozen meals on wheels that for the last year we've done over a thousand, we being multiple churches, including St. Peter's. I can talk about Hope Mission and how St. Peter's members provide up to 120 meals for people in need on Saturday, the fourth Saturday. I could talk about feeding the 5,000 at Martha's Mission, which we do. As this church, we gather food and donate food for those in need. I could talk about the increase we've seen at Martha's Mission. I could talk about the increase we've seen in those 835 children. A little over a year ago, it was only 650. But I won't, but I kind of already did. So I, in, my, in my daily Bible study, um, I had a few things I wanted to, I, I had jotted down, not uh, just what came to me as I prepared for my Sunday school lessons. And here's one. Although you and your circumstances may change dramatically, I remain the same, past, present, and future, throughout time and eternity. This is the basis of your confidence to give generously of your time and money. In my presence, you give and move and have your very being. And another one was, my kingdom is not about e earning and deserving it's about believing and receiving. 
And from Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Tithing is a personal thing. It's biblical. It's required to help others. We would not have been able to meet in Greenville had it not been for the fourth, forethought and foresight of a gentleman called Mr. Duke, who lived in Raleigh and let, created an endowment through the Methodist Church to serve others. Thank you for his foresight and his and the on the congregation there. I wanted to <clears throat> end by saying what you give. I've mentioned all these examples. Every one of those examples were people were the result of Christian people, Christian churches, all reaching into the community to give. St. Peter was told by Christ, feed are my sheep. This community, this church is doing just that. And let me bring us back to our fundamentals in Methodism by reading John Wesley's covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you will, write me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Give with a giving heart. It will reap much reward. Praise to God. Praise to Jesus Christ. Praise to this church. Praise to Pastor Carl for bringing us the word as this is written. Amen. Thank you, Bill. And now let us enter into the spirit of worship as we stand and we sing together hymn number 719, My Lord, What a Morning.
please be seated. Let's talk about good things that are going on in your life, places that you have seen God move this week. Does anybody have a celebration or a joy they'd like to share this morning? I've got one that I will share. I went to pilgrimage this weekend. I don't know how many people here have ever been to pilgrimage. Okay, we don't have a lot in here who've been to pilgrimage. But if, if you can imagine a thousand teenagers from like sixth grade through twelfth grade all together in one place. And uh, they're there with their youth leaders and there's a band up on the stage and there are speakers who come and they preach and they share the word and they pray and all these kids are up and dancing and jumping around and having so much fun. And there's something the kids do now, and I don't know what it is, but it's some sort of a dance that it just starts. And I walked in yesterday and the band was up on the stage and all of a sudden the music started and every child in there got up and they all started doing this same thing all in sync with each other. And it was amazing to see this. And it gave me great hope for the church. And on Friday night, the speaker got up and, and, and she talked about healing. And, and she talked in terms of all of these young people who were there. And, and you guys remember what it's like to be a teenager. You're, you're trying to fit in. I'm, I'm not going to say who, but somebody here was going, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> but there's, there's this sense of wanting to belong wanting to fit in, trying to fit in, trying to figure out who you are. And there's just so much confusion that goes on in life. And this person got up and talked to all these young people and talked about how each one of them was so important and so valuable and everybody in there needed some type of healing and that through Christ, that healing was available. And, and then she made an invitation and all these kids went down to the front. And the kids were putting their hands on each other, laying hands on each other. And the kids were weeping over each other and praying for one another. And I thought, wow, this is just, this is beautiful. And the whole topic for the weekend was how God shows up when you least expect it. And I wasn't, I, I always expect pilgrimage to be great. But I did not expect Friday night to become as spiritually powerful as it did. Grown men wept on Friday night. Young people wept on Friday night. It was just, it was such a blessing for me to be there. So I just, I lift up a praise to God for that. And they're, they're still there this morning and they're still going. And I had to leave yesterday, one, so I could be here today, and two, I don't have enough energy left to make it through a whole weekend of pilgrimage. But that's a big praise. Anybody else have a praise this morning they'd like to share? I'm going to have to get you a little nameplate up here, Bill. This is <laughs> becoming your desk. Oh, please don't. I like to be in the background. Anonymous. You can just put a nameplate anonymous. That's a big word. I have problems with big words. I have uh, words this morning of praise. Thanks. Thanks to the Lord. For this last hurricane came on shore just 35 miles from my daughter's house. And she had no damage to the house. And daughter and grandboys, uh, grandkids, actually young men now. Uh, 17 and 23. We're all okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We, we remember that there are people who are suffering in the world right now, some from things like this storm that just came through. Like I said, I was in an arena full of young people. I know that there's a lot of hurt among those young people. There's a lot of hurt among the big people in our church right now. There's a lot of hurt in our world. There's hunger in our world. 
There's distrust in our world. There's war in our world. There's disease in our world. How many of you here personally know somebody who's struggling right now? This is the time that we go to the Lord for them. When I saw those children praying over each other and and my daughter Amber was there and she was in her wheelchair and the youth from this church just all gathered around her and they had their hands over her and they were praying over her. And I was like, "This this is what we're called to do, pray for one another. And so this next little time in our service, this is a really important time when we pray for other people. I want you to think about some of those who were hurting. Really focus on them in this moment. Focus on God's ability to reach down and bring a healing to them. Will they be cured? Maybe, maybe not. But will they be healed? Yes, they'll be healed. Sometimes the healing involves a cure. Sometimes it doesn't. But the healing is there. And we're going to pray now for God to heal those who are hurting. I invite anyone who'd like to come and kneel during this special time of intercessory prayer to please come forward. And now let us pray. Gracious Lord, when we look around us, we're reminded of how broken our world has become. We see people who are hurting. We see situations that need peace. And so we bow our heads acknowledging your authority to take what seems upended and set it aright. We know that you alone can fix what's shattered in people's lives, in our own lives, the lives of those around us. We fully trust that you can restore hope where despair has taken root that you can shine light where there is darkness and that you can bring healing. And so with confidence, we now lift up prayers for our brothers and sisters who are hurting this day and who are in need of a knowledge of your presence in their lives, especially this day. We pray for these we now name before you. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you're able as we're going to sing a hymn of praise number 2190 from the faith we sing. It's called Bring Forth the Kingdom. Come on. 
Amen. Please be seated. And join me now as we go to the Lord confessing our sins. Lord of the ages, in our busy lives, we do not always make time to love, to pray, or to sing your praises. We want to be strong, yet we often feel out of control, buffeted by the winds of change, burned by the fires of doubt. Forgetting what we cannot see, we ask, why have you forgotten me? Help us trust your presence. Even when we feel utterly alone, trapped in our dark night of the soul. Promise of Christ as our hope, lead us from our own wilderness wanderings into the well-tended garden of your love. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from the book of Galatians. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as forgiven children of God, let us stand and share with one another the peace of Christ. All right, let's invite the children and the young people to come down to the front. Good morning. All right, who wants to guess what I've got in my bag today? What do you think I have in there? What? No? What do you think, AJ? You think I have God in my back? <laughs> you know, you listen, don't you? Because I tell you that every, every time I ask a question, like the answer is always God or Jesus, right? So that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I have, what is this? A mug. A mug. A, this is a mug. What would I drink out of this mug? Coffee, that's right. So this, this is like a coffee cup. And if you look at this side, it looks like a prescription bottle, doesn't it? Like you would get medicine in. And it's a prescription for coffee. 
and it's by Dr. Harold Feelgood, and it's made out to Mr. Java Joe Espresso. It says, drink one mug by mouth, repeat until awake and alert, and that's what it says on the label. But I brought this because every single day, one of the very first things I do in the morning is have a cup of coffee. That's one of the first things. I can't start my day without a cup of coffee. How many people out here cannot start your day without a cup of coffee? See, that's a lot of people, isn't it? So this is a really good way for me to start my day. I can't imagine my day without that. Now, I've got something else in here that I cannot start my day without. Do you know what it is? It's a Bible, that's right. And I've had this Bible for a long time. Um, I think one Easter Sunday when I was a little boy and I got my Easter basket, this was in my Easter basket. And I've had this. I know it's so long that the cover is bent on it, isn't it? But this, this is a Bible. And every single day, the way I start my day is I start it with a cup of coffee and I start it with my Bible. And I cannot begin a day without this or without this. Now, watch this again. How many people cannot begin your day without this? All right, now, do I dare ask? <laughs> you don't have to put your hands up because I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But as you guys get older, you probably don't drink coffee now. I hope you don't drink coffee now. You do drink a lot of coffee. I drink a, mug, a, mug, drink a mug of chinos. A mug of chinos? Okay, so that's not really coffee. That's not really coffee. People say that's coffee. I don't think that's coffee. But someday you'll probably be one of these people who drinks coffee every day. I don't know if you will or not. And to be honest, it doesn't matter to me. But it does matter to me that you grow up to be somebody that can't start your day without God's word. This is where we can really learn from God, is reading his word, okay? So, so you guys going to start reading your Bible tomorrow morning? Those of you who are old enough to read, you say, yes, Pastor Carl, yes, we're going to do that. Ken's like, no, I'm being honest. I'm not going to do that yet. <laughs> but this, this is good stuff, folks, good stuff. And I hope that you grow to love that book like I do. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for these beautiful children. Thank you for the adults that brought them here today to make sure that they were in church. What a gift that is. And what a gift they are to this faith community. I pray, Lord, you'll help us to help them grow to love your word so that they cannot imagine a day without it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as we turn to hear from God's word, I invite you to stand if you're able. We are hearing the word of God. Our reading today comes from Luke chapter 21, beginning with verse 5 and reading through verse 19. Luke 21, verse 5. And as some spoke of the temple... How it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign when this is about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for this must first take place. But the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes 
and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and kinsmen and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now in response to this hearing of God's word, let us again say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in God the Holy Spirit. I believe the three are one. pray. Lord, as you have spoken us, spoken to us through your word being read aloud this morning, I pray now that you will continue to speak through the words of your servant. Help me, Lord, to make your truths known in Christ's name. Amen. The temple in Jerusalem was the pride and joy of ancient Israel. And when you read Josephus, who was a, uh, like a first century Jewish historian, when he writes about the temple, he says that it was so beautiful that the way that the sunlight reflected off of it, you almost couldn't look at it because it was so bright. But that this building, the temple, was the center of life in community for the people of God. The people loved the temple. They loved everything that it stood for. Today, some people feel that way about their local church. They have a sense of pride in their church. They have a sense of ownership. You notice I said their church. And it's not a bad thing to refer to a church as my church or our church, so long as we're using that word to identify the church, not to claim the church. You know, like someone says, well, where do you go to church? Well, that's my church over there. My church is located behind the Holiday Inn Express. I'm not saying I own this church. I'm saying this is the church that I'm a part of. I'm associated with this church. But we don't ever want to act like we own the church. Because we don't. We don't want to fall in love with the building. We don't want to fall. It's great to love the building. That's great. But we don't want to fall in love with the building or the traditions or anything else to the point that they take precedence over our love for Jesus. 
Or we don't ever want to love the church and the tradition and the ways more than the need to share the gospel with somebody who needs to hear it. Sometimes I look at the local church and, when I, and understand when I stand up here and I preach about the local church, I'm not pointing fingers at St. Peter's. I'm pointing fingers at every single local church that there is. But sometimes I wonder if some local churches are more concerned with keeping disciples than making disciples. Or when churches start being concerned about keeping their doors open, what are they concerned about? Is it institutional preservation? We want to keep our church, we want to keep our doors open because we want this church to stay here. It's been here forever. We need it to be here forever. Or are we trying to keep our doors open because there's people that need salvation? And with those doors open, there's an invitation for them to come and find salvation. That's the reason we need to focus on keeping the doors open. But people can get too comfortable with their church, with the local church. We can get too comfortable with our way of doing things. And when that happens, what we're focusing on are man-made institutions. And man-made institutions don't need to be our focus at the church. Because when they become our focus, our love for our church detracts from our love for the Lord. Our love for our church can detract from our love for others. And this is what had happened with the temple. The people that were talking to Jesus, their focus is literally on the building, on the structure. They say, look at, this, look at this beautiful stonework. Isn't it magnificent? They're telling Jesus, look what we made. Look what we created. Look what we have built. The temple had a history. And for the people there, those stones represented that history. Those stones also represented the present. And in their eyes, they also represented the future, but the future was unknown. Their love for the past deceived them into thinking the future would look exactly the same as the past. The people were telling Jesus, look how beautiful this, this place is. Look how beautiful everything is here. And Jesus says, don't fall in love with the temple. Don't become obsessed with the temple or what goes on within the temple because one day the temple is going to be gone. It's only temporary. One day the temple will be gone. And in 70 AD, when Jerusalem was under siege from the Roman army, the temple fell. That Jewish historian Josephus he writes an account of that day. I'm not going to share his account this morning because it is pretty horrific. His account is, is one of those things that today you would get a little a trigger warning, a, a, fla, a, a you know, parental advisory before reading it because it is a pretty horrific description of what happened. But the bottom line is the temple fell just as Jesus said it would. You see, humanity has no handle on what is to come. God does, but we don't. Now, in this discussion in the temple that day, Jesus was addressing a bigger issue than a building falling down. He was saying, or what he was focused on, rather, were man-made institutions and misplaced priorities. Jesus was addressing our human tendency to focus more on the temporary than the eternal. To be more concerned with the here and now than eternity. The people in the temple that day, they were obsessed with what they had. They said, look at this beautiful stonework, Jesus. And Jesus says, 
Buildings don't last forever. Those stones are going to fall. This building is going to fall. Human institutions don't last forever. Don't put faith in them. Because this building will fall. And so the people say, well, when? When is it going to happen? What are going to be the signs? We, we want a timetable. We know we want to be ready. We want to know, we, uh, we want to know when to start looking for things to happen. We've got to be able to plan for this future. Jesus doesn't give them a timetable, does he? Jesus instead says, there's going to be wars. There are going to be insurrections. Nations will rise against nations. There's going to be earthquakes, famines, plagues. Sounds like nothing is off the table. He doesn't say anything about when. But he does say there are going to be tough times ahead. I think those are a good word for us. We're facing tough times in the church these days. In case you haven't heard, the United Methodist Church is going through a difficult season of separation right now. And this coming Saturday, our conference is going to gather in Fayetteville to ratify the disaffiliation of churches who've chosen to leave, that is, chosen to cut their ties with our denomination. I'm not going to talk a lot about the details on that. You guys have heard me talk about the details on that. Some people call it, some people call this separation a split. Some people call it a splintering. I guess splintering doesn't sound as harsh as a split. But here, Whatever you want to call it, however you view it, it reminds us of a reality that cannot be denied. And it's a reality that Jesus spoke of in the temple that day. Human institutions do not last forever. Not the temple and not the church. Now, got to make sure you understand the church as the body of Christ in the world, that is, the family of believers in the world, that is always going to stand. That is never going to end. Amen. But the human institution of the church, that is, how we do this life together, that's all temporary. The buildings we use, the songs we sing, the traditions, none of these are permanent. And when something is not permanent, that means it's subject to change. Saying that something's not permanent doesn't mean it's going to go away. It might go away. But one thing it says is it's subject to change. Has the church ever changed? The church has changed a lot since its inception on the day of Pentecost. The community of people in the world who believe in Christ, that community has constantly undergone change in how they live life together, how they do life in community. It's changed. Some of those changes have been for the better. Some of them have not. Denominations have been formed. You know, I'm going to talk about the change in the church. I have a friend... Um, you guys might remember Jack Kalenda. He preached for me some while I was sick. And um, when we were talking about this splintering or whatever you want to call it in the United Methodist Church, he said, I'll be honest. He said, I kind of wish that that other split hadn't happened. I said, what split? He said, the one where Martin Luther took his hammer and nailed something to a door. He said, that was when all the problems started. Well, I don't know if it's when all the problems started. I think the problems were there before that. But the fact is the church has changed so much over the last 2,000 years. Denominations have been formed. 
Denominations have split to form new denominations. Individual churches have split, sometimes over things as trivial as the color of a new carpet. When people are involved, and you can't have church without people, right? When people get involved, life can get messy. And when life gets messy and people are involved, you can have division. And that's what we are experiencing now as a people called Methodist. But what doesn't change, what never changes, is the love of God. The love of God that frees us from our sins. The love of God that was shown through the life when Jesus gave his life on the cross. That love doesn't change. The love of God that creates community between believers. That love doesn't change. The love of God that flows out through believers to others who yearn to be loved. That love doesn't change. The love God pours into us to offer to others who need to feel loved, who need to know God's love for themselves, that love does not change. The scriptures say, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is talking about an eternal love and an eternal promise of eternal life. God's love for humanity is permanent. It's unchanging. But what we do with that love can change. The choices we make on how to live with each other within that community, those change. Thus, the church changes. God's love is perfect and unchanging. The church, not always. So as Christians, as people who follow Christ, where should our focus be? On the unchanging love of God or on the human institution that we call our church? I'm thankful that the church is subject to change because the church, as hard as we try, the church doesn't always get it right, do we? The church is constantly in need of change, not at our hands or by our choice, but we're in need of change through the transformative power of God to change us. The church can fully be what God intends it to be if we're not standing still marveling at the stonework. The church can be what God wants it to be, what God needs it to be, if we're not standing in God's way. Do we have tough times ahead for the church? We do. We always will. Until Jesus comes back, there's going to be tough times ahead for the church. But listen to these words from Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 9, the Lord says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There may be tough times ahead. But I'm so thankful that we don't have to face it on our own. I offer you these truths in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Bill Douglas shared today some of the ways that the tithes and offerings that are given to, to God's church fulfill ministries and can even put food in people's hands. And as we, as we present to God his tithes and our offerings, it is a way for us to worship God. It is a way for us to thank God. It is a way for us to love God. And it's also a way for us to love others because we are giving to help support the ministries of the church. So now, through giving, let us continue to worship the Lord. Gracious Lord, thank you for all you do for us. Accept from us with, with our gratitude these, your tithes and our offerings. Take these, Lord, and use them to spread your love through this world in Christ's name. Amen. Christ did indeed tell us that as we go through life following him, that there will be tough times. But God is with us always. And so no matter how tough the times get, we can say it is well with my soul.
so much for your words, for your truth. Lord, let us go out and our focus be on being a fisher of men and having our church go forth and teach the truth. And as we have our morning breakfast, please, Lord, bless it. Bless the hands that prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have courage. Do no harm. Do all the good you can and stay in love with God. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Son Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.